lo and behold, pages came out about her. Uh, so, what, how was I like? Well, the first sentence in the, that came out of the computer was, St. Catherine of Siena was a virgin. Well, a virgin I am not. <laughs> I had 10 children, 36 grams of little black. So, there I'm opposite. Uh, but Catherine of Siena died at age 35. I'm twice that now, so there we go. Uh, Catherine of Siena hobnobbed with the popes. She told them what to do. Uh, pope Gregory the 11th, I think, and Pope Earl the 6th or something. And I, I don't even know a pope. <laughs> the closest I ever got was two years ago, my little granddaughter went to Rome and brought me home a pair of little pair of She was blessed by Pope John Paul, which I carry with me all the time. And this October, I'm going to Rome, so maybe I'll get a glimpse of him. And I'm taking a Dominican with me when I go. <laughs> uh, and, uh, what else? Uh, but there was something similar when I was thinking about it. She was uh, interested in the poor and the downtrodden and the homeless. And that's the way I'm trying to work myself into heaven. I'm hoping the homeless will get me there. My two favorite songs that I try to live by is Whatsoever You Do, and God and All the Hungry Millions. When I was little, I didn't think much about the homeless. Well, for the last 15 years, I've been thinking about the homeless. Um, when I was small, I was doing my catechism, I was learning my lessons in the little country school yard in the plains of Nebraska. Then I went on to Sacred Heart School in Greeley, Nebraska, where I was first introduced to the Dominican Sisters. There I got my four years of good Catholic education with the Dominican sisters. And they taught me much. Sister Agnes Fields was, oh, she was a beautiful woman, very young, a beautiful woman. She was the choir director. I joined the choir, and I am singing away one day, and she's saying, there's someone a little off-key, let's start <laughs> So we started again, and I'm singing away. So at the end of the lesson, she came over to me and she said, Catherine, you can stay in the choir, just mouth it. <laughs> that I also learned from Sister out there are nice ways of saying, telling somebody off. She could have she said, you can't sing, get out of here, but she didn't. She was very sweet about it. And Sister Gabriel was another one that got much compassion. When my father died in 1937, um, I was out of school for three weeks. Now, why I was out of school for three weeks, I don't know. But I never t I shed a tear on my father's death after that point. I came into school. I'm sitting in the back desk, back I see. And Sister Gable comes over, puts her arms around me, says nothing, puts her arms around me. And I burst into tears. So that was the beginning of my healing process of my father's death. And other, uh, other sisters, Sister Felix, Sister Mary Martin, Sister Mary Morris, all my teachers that I still remember fondly. There are two sisters here today, I think, Sister Carolyn and Sister Mary Lawrence, who were teachers. They weren't teachers. They didn't teach me, but they were in the Sacred Heart at that time. But I did learn much from the, uh, from the Dominican sisters. In fact, I learned so much that they awarded me a scholarship to the Hastings Business College on graduation. I went on, and the next year I became a secretary in the bank in Red Island, Nebraska, and that's where I met my Flyboy married him and moved to Staten Island, New York. So for the first few years in Staten Island, I was busy raising a family. And then when my kids started into the Immaculate Conception School, I started my volunteering there. Um, I had 10 kids who went through that school. My father and my husband before them had gone through there. So we had 98 years of education in that school. So I rather felt that I owed them a little volunteering. <laughs> And then, the homeless. Sometimes it takes a little child to lead you. And one day, my son, Mark, came home from um, school. He was in St. Peter's High School. He was just finishing his senior year. And he said, we're not going to have an organized religion class the last semester. We have to go out and get a, a community project to do. I said, well, um, I read in the church bulletin that Project Hospitality, the local homeless shelters, had been meeting looking for volunteers this afternoon. Let's go. So he and Don, a friend, a retired friend of ours, and I, and I went down to see what they had to say. Well, they said they were opening this new shelter on Tuesday night. 
they needed volunteers to stay overnight with the men and they needed people to cook. So John, Don and Mark signed up to stay overnight on Tuesday night. Don would sleep from 10 to 2, Mark would sleep from 2 to 7. They'd wake the men up, give them cereal, and send them on the way. So I thought, well, since they're going to do that, why don't I volunteer to cook there on Tuesday night? So I did. And uh, I cooked the first meal that was cooked in that shelter when it opened. June came, Mark graduated from high school. August came, he went on to Nebraska, the University of Nebraska, so that was the end of his volunteering there. But I was hooked, I stayed on. Everybody said, how wonderful, what a wonderful thing you're doing. But to me, I was getting much more out of it than I was giving. It was so nice just to make sure that knowing that these men had a good meal and were settled for the night. And of course, they knew how to play on it. Every night that, when I come in, oh, here comes our Tuesday night cook. This is our great cook, isn't this great? But I'm sure they said that to every cook every night. But I really was, was hooked on it. Uh, then, uh, back in the 70s, my husband, uh, I'm going back a little age now. This was after that. But back in the 70s, my husband was uh, involved in the beginning of daytime. Once a year, O'Brien had to wanted to start a day job on Staten Island and it was much opposed by most people so uh, he worked with Muncie and Brian very close and then I worked with them but I was a solid follower. I hadn't learned how to be a leader at that time but I uh, did uh, was, he did great work in that. Uh, let me see. After uh, after this shelter that I cooked for for quite a few years closed, they closed, uh, they uh, moved the men uh, so they could renovate this and make a, uh, they would make a uh, home for 23 um, mentally and physically disabled people. So they closed the shelter and then uh, they went, they had to go from one church hall to another and they ate down to the outreach center. So I still cook, cooked on Tuesday night, but I didn't, I didn't, uh, Cook it, and they came and got the food and cooked it. So I, I missed the interaction with the men. I used to see them every Tuesday night. Now I saw them no more except on the Tuesday before the 4th of July, I always had them to my deck for a cookout. And the Tuesday before Christmas, I always had them to my house for a sit-down dinner. But now their number has grown so large that I can't fit them in my house for a sit-down dinner, so I have them at the school hall. And that worked out very well, so hopefully we'll do that for years to come. But some people are just reluctant to get involved with the homeless. But you never know when you just that going that extra mile will mean so much to them. The, one of the Fourth of Julys, or may, it may, may have been the second or third one that I was having, and my daughter Marjorie gave me a uh, blue kitchen fork set, a cutlery set for, and I said, well, I'm not going to put that in. Yeah, I don't have to buy plastic forks. So these are usually on my deck. I have plastic forks, whether it's for my friends, my neighbors, uh, even the mayor. But I uh, said, no, I'll we'll use these forks. So at the end of the day, this one man said, you know, the weather was beautiful, the food was good, the conversation was great, but the one thing I appreciated more than anything was a real fork. I haven't had a real fork in my hand for five years. So needless to say, that they have never had plastic again when they come to my deck. And another one that was hard to believe was this uh, house uh, where they had the uh, home uh, for the, the disabled. Uh, I made Easter baskets for them at Easter time. Last year, I made Easter baskets for them, and I got a card a couple weeks after. A beautiful handmade card with everybody's little thank you. This one man said, uh, thank you for my Easter basket. That was the first gift that I ever received my whole life. Well, naturally, I found out when his birthday was in July, he got his second gift. But so you just never know. And this year, when I was making the Easter baskets, other people came forth. Uh, some women had uh, donated candy for us that they could help me put them together. And so people do like to get involved, but sometimes they just don't know where to start. So when you're doing something like that, you should invite people to join you, because that's how volunteerism grows. Be thanked for it. They were so happy to be able to do this, and they're looking forward to doing it again next year. Uh, I have received uh, a few awards in my lifetime, but the biggest one I received was four years ago when uh, Terry Troyer, Reverend Terry Troyer, the uh, minister who heads up Project Hospitality, got Cardinal O'Connor's uh, permission to 
name in this house on Tartu Street where I cooked the first dinner and went home of the disabled now in the Pearson Mac O'Callaghan house. So it's uh, an award that we just never thought would ever happen. I'm just thrilled about it. Um, and, uh, but I have to tell you the story in closing. In closing, I have to tell you about my good friend, Sister, used to be Pauline Fitzpatrick. She's now Sister Agnes. She is the sister of um, Sister Maria Fitzpatrick. Well, a few years ago, I was down here talking to Sister Maria Fitzpatrick, and I was telling her how I graduated from the College of Staten Island at the ripe old age of 62, and how for my last eight credits, I had written uh, my memoirs from the prairie to the harbor. The first semester was Life on the Prairie. The second was Life on the Harbor. So Sister uh, Maria asked to read my book. So I sent it to her. I was flattered she wouldn't read it. I sent it to her. She sent it on to Sister Agnes. But that's as far as I got it. Oh, well, that's not how far I went. It came here today. So you people at this moment are totally bored. Blame it all on Sister Maria Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Like some 